A key component of the modern world economy, the chemical industry delivers products and innovations to enhance everyday life. It is also an industry in transformation, where chemical executives and workers are delivering growth and industry-changing advancements while responding to pressures from investors, regulators, and public opinion. Discover how leading companies are approaching these challenges here on The Chemical Show. Join Victoria Meyer, president of Progressio Global and host of The Chemical Show, as she speaks with executives across the industry and learns how they are leading their companies to grow, transform, and push industry boundaries on all frontiers. Here's your host, Victoria Meyer. Hi, this is Victoria Meyer. Welcome to The Chemical Show. This week, I am speaking with John Yagel, who is the VP of Continuous Improvement, Capital, and Innovation Excellence for Huber Engineered Materials. John has 30 plus years of experience in the chemical and materials industries at leading companies, including Dow and Grace, and is an expert in manufacturing and operational excellence. So John is bringing that expertise um, and experience to our conversation today on the podcast. John, welcome to The Chemical Show. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Good morning. Yeah, glad to have you here. So what's your origin story? What got you into the world of chemicals um, and what brought you to where you are today in your career? Sure, absolutely. Well, I guess um, I would say it started because I love a challenge. And uh, I was I was close uh, to my um, some of my teachers in school and, and learned a lot about chemistry. And uh, I wanted to take on a challenge. So one thing led to another. And pretty soon I was at Penn State in chemical engineering. And, and of course, that led me into the industry. And um, I've had a lot of great uh, employers over the years you know, for various uh, positions. And uh, a good portion of my career was with Dow Chemical and starting out. And, and Dow, I, I still look back at Dow. It's a fabulous company from a, a manufacturing and operations perspective. Great place to grow up and learn about how to do it right. Yeah. Awesome. That's really cool. Um, and today you're at Huber engineered yes. materials. Can you just, That's right. I, I think some people may not be fully familiar with them. Can, so can you give a brief sure, overview absolutely. of the company? Yep, exactly. Uh, Huber, uh, under the, the, the corporation of JM Huber, and we have several different business segments. I'm in the business segment called uh, Huber engineered materials. And, uh, we make several different, we have several different businesses and several different product lines, that provide um, products for all different areas. Uh, it, it, to name a couple of them, yeah. we have an area called fire retardants, uh, fire retardant additives. And uh, so that is a non-halogenated material that is used in industry to prevent uh, fires and smoldering and things like that. So you would find it in the insulation of wires, uh, especially in your car, as Got well it. as uh, some building materials, carpeting and things like that. And uh, so it's a great material for um, preventing fire and also for uh, heat management and, and trying to uh, dissipate the heat very well. Interesting. And then That's another great. area that is one of our businesses is called um, specialty minerals. And in specialty minerals, we have um, a whole series of products, which is ground calcium carbonate. Uh, it goes into many material, many uh, uh, products out there in the market, uh, largely building materials uh, for your home, uh, for flooring and walls and uh, in different areas like that. Uh, but also we have some very high quality and very high purity areas that go into uh, nutritional needs like um, uh, supplements, nutritional supplements, vitamins, uh, in that whole area. Oh, that's and, interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, recently, we purchased a company called Natural Soda, and it's in the minerals, the specialty minerals business. And Natural Soda is a company that mines uh, sodium bicarbonate, which is baking soda. And uh, so most of all the baking soda that we know of is um, synthetically made. And uh, and we purchased a company that has a mine, actually, in uh, Colorado. And they uh, use solution mining to uh, dissolve it uh, and uh, bring it back up to the surface and then um, re-precipitate it into a product. And it goes in all kinds of markets, like uh, for, for animal uh, feed and nutrition and uh, various other forms for natural, for uh, natural occurring baking soda. Yeah, that's interesting. So why would, um, why would you mine the baking soda, the carbonate versus well, synthetically produce it? What's the, there must be pros and cons to this. It doesn't exist very often in a in a natural state. It is the probably the biggest reason, and uh, and since it is in a natural state, um, 
it's it's a very good uh, material for um, uh, feed and things like that. Okay. Huh. That's interesting. I wouldn't have thought that. Um, I guess that, you know, it's one of those common products that sure. probably many of us don't know about, including myself. That's exactly right. And then the third, so, the third area yeah. is, is, is agro solutions. And uh, this is actually a, a more recent, a new, a new business area for us. And we've made a couple of purchases in the last several years. And uh, this is where we're making um, chemical fertilizers and various additives for the growers and farmers to put in their spray systems uh, for plants. And, um, you know, we target a lot of different products of farm um, um, items that are in the fruits, nuts, vegetables area. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's interesting. That's uh, it prompts a follow up question that I'm going to come to later. I hope I sure. remember it. Um, John, do you guys operate globally, or is it primarily a North American business? We do operate globally. Uh, we have a we have a good size footprint in uh, North America as well as uh, Germany, uh, Austria, uh, and now with some of our new acquisitions um, in Italy and Hungary and, and various other countries. Cool. Very cool. So, so you've had a long career in manufacturing and in operational excellence, and you really, I know that's operational excellence is a passion and a focus area for you. Can you tell us more about what that is? Sure. How did you get there? Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, operational excellence is um, uh, in a simple form, systematic problem solving and improvements. And, uh, you know, of course, all manufacturing wants to constantly get better and uh, remove defects and and have their operations be trouble free. And, and operational excellence is a way uh, to bring together several different functions, um, like problem solving and reliability and quality and safety and all these different areas. And um, it probably goes back a, a lot to uh, some of the disciplines that we've all learned and heard about, like Six Sigma and lean manufacturing and things like that. So that's a, a huge piece of, of operational excellence. But there are other areas in there, too, like, um, you know, various technologies for reliability and, um, and, and even transportation systems and logistics and everything like that. Yeah, that's interesting. So you would operational excellence would be the umbrella that covers some of the six sigma lean, the process Correct. management, et cetera. Yeah, that's cool. I actually, I've, I've uh, in my earlier in my career, I've gone through that space a couple different times. In fact, running operational excellence, but much more for um, supply chain and sure. the the customer centers, the business operation side of operational yes. excellence. So it's, um, I think there's a lot of. I can see the value right at the Absolutely. end of the day. I think most chemical companies actually are operationally excellent. Now that doesn't mean that they're not, that they're perfect, obviously, but I think there's this inherent tendency and maybe it's the engineers and all of us that, that drive towards operational excellence, but also it's really about safety and efficiency yes. and uh, cost effectiveness and just business process effectiveness. Yes. That's exactly right. And, and there's also close ties to a world um, that is called process safety management and, and making sure that all of our, our chemical factories and production plans, refineries and everything are operating in a way that, you know, they're not going to catch on fire and, and have injuries uh, of very large uh, magnitude. Yeah, interesting. So, so you've been doing this a long time. How yeah. has it changed, right? So if you think about operational excellence earlier in your career versus where we are today. Yeah. What's different? Yeah, there are a couple areas that are that are quite different. The the base activity is the same. Basically, you know, problem solving and and driving perfection and excellence into everything you do, that part is obviously the same. But I would also say that in the beginning in my in my beginning of my career, it was then a a nice way to have a competitive advantage. And uh, it was a way that you can get out in front of your competitors, uh, reduce your costs, provide more product at a, at a better value. And today it, it's more closer to a table stake. It, it's uh, it's something that it exists in a lot of different areas and has made tremendous you know benefit um, uh, and driven value throughout the industry. So um, I would say that's one change that, that it has become more of a regularly occurring uh, scenario for companies to have that. That doesn't mean everyone has it now. There are still yeah. companies in, in production plans that that still need to kind of get on the, the uh, activities of operational excellence. Another area that I, I would say has made huge differences and has grown over the years is digitization. 
And uh, in the in the beginning, you know, even 20, 30 years ago, having all this data and information was difficult. Uh, you know, it was yeah. very difficult to pull all the information and data. And and that's the the nature of problem solving is to have the right data that you can understand what exactly is happening so you can analyze it very well. And over time, uh, through all different ways, the world of process control and data collection and AI and, and being able to take massive amounts of data and analyze it and, and put it through various algorithm algorithms to uh, come up with an answer has really changed it quite a bit. And we're, and we're using that, some of that right now with, um, with digitization and trying to understand um, anything from reliability to uh, various other areas. Yeah. Do you, when you think about that whole digitization uh, and that data and operational excellence, do you also bring like process control into that? Yes. Or do yep. you think about it as being outside the reactor as opposed to inside the reactor? No, absolutely inside, without any doubt. Okay. And, and there are a couple different terms for what you just mentioned, uh, process control or industrial control systems, whatever it is, it's basically the computer that runs your process. And of course the computer can watch it uh, you know, with, at, at a rate that is much greater than a human can and, and what we sure. can, can pick up uh, different uh, abnormalities and things like that very well. So um, advanced process control and using that to uh, optimize your process is absolutely under the umbrella of operational excellence. Okay. I would not have, I personally would not have put it under that same umbrella. So that's good to, sure. to understand absolutely. that you do. Well, and also the products have become uh, phenomenal. Uh, you know, back in the early days when when I worked for Dow, we actually produced our own process control computers, and uh, sure. because there because there wasn't anything on the market that satisfied satisfied our needs. And today, that's probably not true um, in today's world. Uh, whether it's from um, ADB or uh, the Siemens or or Rockwell or other, they're all offering just fabulous products that uh, can run your your chemical process. Yeah. Huh. So I know when we were talking earlier too, you, 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 one of the things you shared with me is that operational excellence has gone from process industries like the chemical industry yes, it has. elsewhere. And that's yes, something that you've also seen through your career. That's exactly you right. Examples of that. It's it uh, for it's, it's grown within the business and what you mentioned earlier about customer service and areas like that. So it is, it has, expanded from the manufacturing space into other spaces like supply chain and customer care and everything around that. So it's there, but it's also moved into other industries. And, and two, two of them that I'll mention uh, that, that as consumers, we would know and understand on a daily basis is the hotel industry uses operational excellence. And, and you would, you know, how, how would they possibly use it? But their interest in having your stay at their at their hotel and have it be a perfect stay without any flaws no defects and everything went just yeah. right is a huge piece of their operational excellence and and that's a very hard thing to do to you know to stay somewhere and there wasn't anything that went wrong you know everything in your room is working perfectly um it, you feel comfortable and and uh, and satisfied with the product that you're receiving there and uh, they strive to 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 hit that type of operational excellence so that your customer experience is is as perfect as it can be right and then another area that that we see actually more so on a daily basis, uh, a, a company that I admire and, and have some interface with uh, with some other people is uh, Chick Fil A, and uh, we see this on a daily basis. Uh, you know, at 12, 12 noon, and the line at Chick Fil A is is uh, wrapped around this, the the restaurant, and the way that they process orders and manage the the traffic flow and and make sure that uh, people move through the line and and go through at a at a pace that far uh, beats all the other uh, fast food restaurants. They just yeah. do an amazing job with order fulfillment and and how they deliver the product to the customer in a in a way that is fast. It's nice quality. Uh, you know, everyone has a good experience there. So. They they're a great ex, uh, example of using yeah. operational excellence in a normal day to day operation, and and that's really about when I think about it. As you give these examples, John, it's really about systems, it's processes, yes. it's using the data to be uh, to maybe be both predictive as well as responsive. That's exactly right, um, et cetera. Yeah. And, it, and is that one of the differences? And when you think about operational excellence, has it just kind of evolved from? 
I guess this whole, the predictive aspect of it, right? Yes. I think to me has probably what's been evolved. In, so and pre least, predictive- Especially with pre digitization, right? Absolutely. Predictive and preventative activities have always existed within the world of maintenance and reliability. And now they're expanding into new areas like, uh, like it, in a chemical reaction and being able to predict the quality of your product just by watching the original reaction of the polymer or or whatever it may be in the reactor. So uh, it has evolved quite a bit. And originally, I think coming largely from the world of reliability and being able to uh, predict, you know, vibration or any other type of movement in rotating equipment to uh, to now we're using AI to um, make predictions on um, on product quality, on delivery, on service and everything around that. Yeah, that's interesting. So John, one of the things I talk a lot about um, on the show is customer experience, right? So I think yes. really the, the key differentiator for most companies is actually their customer experience, right? So product is easily replicated, services and tactics are easily replicated, yes, right. but it's the experience that you bring. And, and the experience, what gets wrapped into it as well is quality in this expectation Absolutely. of quality. Yeah. Uh, reliability of supply and the expectation and and even just the information, right? The ability to provide that's right. that information and uh, and adapt. And so I think uh, I, that's based on this conversation, I would not have necessarily tied operational excellence in with uh, customer experience. Yes. And yet it's a key component. It's a key component. For the holistic company. That's exactly right. And the, and the customer experience is a lot of things. It's it's anything from how, how to pay their bills to how they receive product, how they order product, how well is the supplier looking out for them and kind of has their back and and uh, is trying to make sure that they don't have anything to worry about when you're buying product from us. So uh, yeah, that that ability to gain their trust, their loyalty based on the operational excellence and always being able to supply their product is, is golden. Awesome. That's really cool. So John, the, the events of the past three years, I mean, I think as we entered the, the decade of the 2020s, um, it's been unexpected, right? Versus yeah, what anyone absolutely. would have predicted between the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we've had freezes and hurricanes, um, we've had other significant supply chain disruptions, um, global political uh, issues, you know, and I think about right, Russia turmoil. And more mm -hmm. and other things, right? So all of which have really dramatically impacted the chemical industry in one yeah. way, shape, or form. What do you see as Huber's response, or even just as an industry's response to that, to these issues and these um, situations? Sure, absolutely. And some of these issues that you mentioned, um, we've always, you know, battled them as they come up. Things like the big freeze of one or two years ago and hurricanes yeah. and outages. Uh, we do some of our business along the Mississippi River. So we carefully watch the level of the Mississippi River. And sure. there have been times when the water's too high and you can't you know, use the use it as a waterway. And uh, so we come up with all kinds of creative solutions to move our product or move our raw materials you know, from point A to point B in a in a new way other than using uh, the Mississippi. So that part has kind of always existed. Certainly, um, COVID threw a curveball at us all and, and uh, changed changed life completely. And uh, the one thing I would say about COVID is, and Huber handled COVID in a very responsible way uh, with great um, uh, trust and respect for all of our teammates, making sure that everyone was was uh, working well at work and, and, and had everything, all the right uh, equipment to do the job that they needed to do. So um, really a, a fantastic response uh, throughout that. And, and um, many, many people highly engaged in making sure that yeah. everyone was safe and healthy and, and, uh, as, and we were operating as best we can. One of the things that COVID taught us though, is that remember many people did start working from their home office and, and learn how to use Zoom and everything, but at the factory, at the production plants, they they did not. You know, they went no. to work every single day. So, um, you know, the use of mask and separation, you know, between people and things like that, and um, all of that uh, still continued on a day to day basis. And uh, even even what we normally have in the production plan, our normal daily resource meeting to plan for the day and make sure that all of our priorities are understood. You know, first thing right. in the morning. Even sessions like that, we continued all throughout the COVID time, even if we were doing it by Zoom. You know, in Zoom you know just from the offices and and um, and areas like that but we continued our operations without you know without any um, uh, disrupt disruption or anything like that but I think that the, the piece that 
COVID taught us is um, how to use video conferencing. You know, here we are on Zoom and Teams and uh, other yeah. things like that. And, and prior to COVID, you know, we were a bit timid to do this uh, kind of activity and it was clunky. The tools were not that great. And, uh, you know, we were kind of forced into it. And, right. um, you know, luckily the, the, the market uh, reacted and, and, and uh, provided products that, that do a great job um, in bringing people closer together through the electronic uh, methods. And um, so now, now that we're post COVID, we certainly are traveling now, there's no doubt. And, and most, most, most of the industry is getting out to see their customer and suppliers and things like that. But, but we're using zoom and teams, you know, significantly more than, than ever before. Um, in yeah. making sure that, that we can connect, uh, without necessarily traveling to the other side of the world. Yeah. That has been a significant impact. And in fact, as I've talked with, uh, clients and companies, um, that I meet with the whole issue, you know, so one virtual working has been great for a big part of the industry. Not everybody, right. As you said, not everyone, right. um, the, our frontline workers, our manufacturing staff and logistics and supply chain staff, we need, they've been boots on the ground, right. To make yes. things happen. Um, but I think it's also shifted, uh, you know, this, this whole hurdle to get people back in the office, even yeah. just the hurdle to have the customer and supplier meetings. Like I've, you know, I've had people, That's say, right. yeah. are people actually meeting like that? Yeah, but a yeah. lot less than they used to, right? It's so a lot less. Maybe, yeah. maybe it's still the same number of engagements on a net basis, but the actual in-person stuff has really diminished. Has did, did operational excellence change? Did your approach to operational excellence change as a result of what of these disruptions of the pandemic and of other things? Are you doing things differently today and in 2023 is when this is going to be getting published um, right. versus in 2020? You know, I would say uh, we learned a lot during that time period and, and during the, the COVID time when we were largely in a, in a virtual state, we, uh, we tried to do various types of training and meetings and things like that. And, uh, and it was effective, but not nearly as much as in person. So now that that uh, we feel like we're on the on the other side of COVID, we're back into um, scheduling various trainings that are face to face and and doing activities like that. Whether it's group sessions, bringing teams together, or whatever it may be, but we're we're fairly open with with the concept of bringing people together back together and yeah. uh, and meeting there. I don't think anything can replace this face-to-face -face interaction and being able to, uh, to have a good conversation and, and challenge each other and debate each other and being, uh, being able to do it in person. Um, it, it, you can't beat that with, with Zoom. Yeah, I agree. I, uh, I, I had a really uh, good working session with the group um, earlier uh, this week in person. And, and we even commented, it's like, Oh, you know, so glad that we got together right. in person. Yes. But because it actually, in some ways was faster, the work that we were doing needed to be in-person work. That's right. And we were yeah. far more resilient um, as an in-person team versus on a Zoom call or on a phone call or what have you. So I think that's yeah. a big, a big thing, right? And it might have actually caused us, I, I had this conversation last week with, uh, with a few uh, uh, colleagues that, the world, the virtual world of Zoom and other things like that may actually cause us to move more rapidly because in our former world, we would always try to get together. So we would travel to get together and we would have some meeting and we would say, well, we need to get together. How about the first week of January? Well, half of us aren't available. So how about the second week of January? And on and on and on. And it pushed out, you know, a meeting would push out two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks because of the availability of people. Right. And now being able to get together on Zoom, it's more of a conversation of, well, how about tomorrow? Or how about this afternoon yeah. to do the same thing? So it, it even if the quality is not quite the same as face-to-face, -face, the speed at which we're doing things has really changed. Yeah, I agree with that. I think um, I think there's two sides to that coin, right? Because yeah. you know what I hear from some folks as well as they're like, it's almost too busy. Everybody wants to book book a um, a Zoom meeting when in the past you might have bumped into them in the hallway right. or you might have just said, "Hey, I need five minutes." Okay, I'm giving you five minutes, but you know our inherent um, right. time block when we book things is like a thirty minute meeting. I'm like, oh, "That's right, I need five minutes. Can I just get five minutes?" Yes. Um, right. and and so I think there's the the two sides of it: making us either busier or making us faster. Right. Maybe both. Yeah. Um, so John Hubert. 
is a privately held family owned company, yes. which is very different from some of the other companies that you work with. Yes. Um, what do you see as the difference and how does it change your approach to people, to operational excellence? What, what stands out about just the difference of being in sure. a privately Absolutely. held company? Yeah. It's, you know, the, it's a wonderful family company and the, the, the Huber family has a deep sense of responsibility and, and really being a positive force on the world. And, and, and that comes through in the products that we make and uh, being able to make life better, basically uh, in, in many different ways to um, very uh, charitable and, and working very hard mm -hmm. to uh, provide uh, whether it's uh, Habitat for Humanity or all other, you know, aspects like that. But I would also say uh, we have a huge res respect and, and appreciation for each other, for our, our teammates and at, at all levels of the organization, throughout the organization, in all functions, and uh, a huge sense of, of respect and appreciation for each other. And um, although the, um, you know, it's a, it's a very large company and, uh, and, you know, over 4,000 total in my area of Huber Engineering Materials, almost 2,000 people. But but we really um, value each other and our own development and our collaboration. And uh, it makes diversity uh, uh, fit right into the, our, our strategy and our activities. And we enjoy um, learning and understanding everyone's perspective. So it's a, I, I really appreciate that. We have a, also have... A, a tool that we use, a tool or a set of values that we call the Huber Principles. And uh, you can you can see it out there, you can Google it, and there's a lot of information that we've published about the Huber Principles. But the Huber Principles essentially is our, our guiding um, roadmap, if you will, for various activities that we do. So it's a, a four-piece um, uh, approach of EHS and sustainability. Uh, obviously, we worked on that forever. Um, ethical behavior, making sure that we're proud of everything that we do. Uh, respect for people and making sure that it's a, a work environment with honesty, respect, teamwork and, and recognition. And then uh, and then, of course, the area where I focus a lot is um, to make sure that we have a strong competitive advantage and customer relationship or intimacy and yeah. along with operational excellence. Yeah. So, I mean, it's such a large company. Does it feel like a family owned company? I mean, it feels like a family-owned company. It, it does. Really does. It really it does. does. Huh? Yep. Yeah. Okay. It it literally does. And um, and I've been with some very large companies. You know, Dow is quite large, uh, over sixty thousand people, and um, it did not feel that way there. It was it mm. was uh, no. you know everyone was a number, and uh, and it it didn't have that same feel. Uh, but I would say at Huber, it feels like a family company every day. Yeah. Interesting. So you you touched briefly on sustainability. What role does sustainability play in mm -hmm. your business? Absolutely. Great. I like that a lot. Um, in operational excellence, I've been working on sustainability since be the beginning. And uh, even all the way back to Dow, we worked very hard at energy efficiency and sustainability and, and trying to reduce our footprint in, in many ways. The difference, the interesting part about that is that we were mostly working on that for a cost reduction perspective, right? Right. And like the electricity was expensive, gas was expensive, and um, and we could really gain and and drive a competitive advantage by reducing our overall footprint and and how much it costs to to use and consume all this energy. Today that has grown and and it's still a, a good cost reduction effort. You know, there's no doubt about that, especially with um, you know various areas of the world having sky high um, natural gas and and uh, petroleum prices. But it has now become much more of a um, uh, responsibility to uh, to reduce your footprint and, and work on sustainability. So we are actually um, very very active in this in this field of sustainability. I sponsor the operations activities in in sustainability, which ranges anywhere from normal regular day to day continuous improvement to improved motors and and insulation and everything around that to uh, some innovation type activities to try to understand 
how we can um, change our footprint in a very large way and uh, and make sure that we consume less um, carbon uh, and, and, and make sure that we're using electricity from the right sources of uh, more sustainable sources. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it has become, sustainability has to become a very large part of, of our world and, and very, very much so in the world of operational excellence. Yeah, absolutely. And I do agree with your point that um, the chemical industry has been very focused on sustainability, yes. but not necessarily for the purpose of sustainability, but it was, it started with, you know, as you say, energy efficiency, that's right. um, reduced footprint, the, the whole circularity that's already yes. inherent in the industry, right? Because um, what, you know, what could otherwise be a waste stream instead becomes, oh, well, how can we turn this into something yes. else, another product, yes. a heat source, a fuel source, et cetera. So, um, That's right. you know, one of the things I think across the industry and we're in the industry is getting better. And, and I talk with uh, and work with clients on this in terms of just telling the sustainability story better. Right. Yep. So I think in many ways we've kind of said, well, of course people would understand that we're doing this, but you know, the reality is the general public does not understand. Not that. always. No, they don't get to see all the inner workings and things they like don't. that. They don't. And so right. if we're not understanding it and managing our information and yeah. telling our sustainability story, as yeah. well as continuing to work on it, um, it, it's just an opportunity for us to continue yeah. focusing in this area. And I think you're right. And, and this is kind of a theme that I've heard from a lot of folks on the podcast and elsewhere that sustainability has always been part of our business. Yes. From a energy efficiency, uh, a resource efficiency perspective. Weight reduction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And now we're just really turning it and saying, hey, we do this and it's it's for other reasons as well. It's the bigger picture. Yeah. That's right. Good. Yeah. So John, as we enter into 2023, uh, it's going to be an interesting year, right? So we're sure. seeing high sure. inflation, a potential recession, which I think everybody keeps debating what it is and what it isn't, and, and we'll leave that debate elsewhere. Um, but I know as, as we enter these environments, it typically drives companies to be much more focused on cost yeah. controls and other things that frankly are right in your uh, yes, sweet yeah. spot Absolutely. in terms of operational excellence. Yeah. What are your priorities? So when you look at 2023, what are your priorities and Huber's priorities um, as we go into the year? There's no doubt that, um, you know, whether whether it's a recession or some other economic slowdown, hard to predict and no one can predict it, but yeah. certainly um, a, a large part of the world is anticipating some form of a bit of a storm out in front of us. Right. So with all that in mind, um, it's very common in operational excellence to start to shift your strategy or your focus areas away from uh, maybe uh, additional capacity and move on mm -hmm. to cost reduction, pure cost reduction, and trying to understand uh, what that could be. Of course, we're experiencing, as everyone is, um, amazing levels of inflation. So, uh, so you know, cost reduction is a huge piece of the puzzle simply because our costs are changing on a daily basis. So we we definitely, as we go into the future, have a stronger emphasis in that area, as, as any company would, uh, and especially throughout the chemical industry. Uh, that's a very big part of it. Sustainability is also a huge piece of the of the puzzle, and and that is connected to the cost reductions because we're finding our our energy sources are going up in price. Uh, we want to have a smaller footprint, and and for all the reasons uh, possible, we want to make sure that we're working on that. The other piece I think that is um, a part of operational excellence that is a, a huge priority for the future, and that is further use of digitization and uh, and making sure that we're using the right kind of tools and technologies in the best way we can. And it can range anywhere from, uh, you know, massive data crunching and, and uh, analysis to um, to simple things like on the right on the shop floor and using your your iPhone or iPad or other tools to enter a work order or to you know log the history of a pump or a compressor or anything like that to take pictures of it and, and make sure that we log you know what the history looks like and, and everything around that that we're using tools like that in uh, in every possible way and and I see that very in a very strong way for our future um, it could evolve into um, a better use of, of wearables and you know other connections. Um, yeah. as, as the, the folks out on the shop floor are trying to read procedures or, you know, look up some kind of information about the product or the pump or, or the, uh, the mixing system or whatever it may be. So that digitization part is, um, is a big piece of our future without any doubt. 
and then uh, and then finally i would say in the in the innovation area um the, the part that i think at least for myself that i'm learning about the most is the the need for a very strong customer connection in the world of innovation and really understanding what what is it that they want and not down to the individual product that they want but what kind of properties are they looking for and what kind of um, of uh, attributes are they looking for in um, anything from the customer experience to the product they deliver uh, that that they uh, consume to uh, the way that we ship it to them and 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 how they receive it yeah interesting great stuff. John, thank you for joining us today. On thank the you. Show. I've really enjoyed learning more about you and your experience in Huber um, and how you guys are tackling today's challenges. Fantastic. It's been great to join and I uh, really appreciate the time. Absolutely. And thanks everyone for listening. We will uh, be back again next week with another episode. Cheers. We've come to the end of today's podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time with us and want to learn more. Simply visit thechemicalshow.com for additional information and helpful resources. Join us again next time here on The Chemical Show with Victoria Meyer.